Qualitative Research, Introduction and Overview. In this portion of the presentation, I want to examine the data and analysis that occurs in qualitative research. As we talked about in the uh, data collection portion, the amount of data often is very substantial in qualitative research. And to an extent, what you're attempting to do is find the needle, proverbial needle in the haystack. You're trying to find the important bits of information from all the data that you've collected. Think of it as, you know, again, you interviewing a number of different people about, you know, a, a range of different topics or ideas. And you're trying to sort through to see where commonalities uh, exist between the different uh, actors in your group. You need to look to see where there are similarities, where there are differences, and how they may interpret uh, different events in different ways. So it becomes a fairly complex process. And even though we have this massive amount of data and information, we have to approach it in a logical way. In qualitative research, what we call that is data analysis and data interpretation. So qualitative data analysis begins typically with the first step, which is called data reduction. And that's a great term because it gives us a good idea of what we're doing here. Think about it. If you interview a person, you give them these open-ended questions, they're going to answer your question, but they're also going to provide other information. You know, if talking to some people, they may be going on and on about relatives or what they had for lunch or whatever. It's easy for them to get distracted. Data reduction, what you attempt to do first off is you remove that data that isn't necessarily related to the topic, isn't impactful on your questions that you're attempting to answer, and then start to develop some themes uh, and in the responses that you see by reading and rereading all of your data sources. So if it's an interview, you're reading over the transcripts, you're listening to them again, you know, what seemed to be most important, most relevant to the person you're interviewing. And you start to identify themes. You know, they, they, uh, they talk about how busy they are. You know, in the study that we've been discussing, you know, maybe they talk about how busy they are a few times. Maybe they talk about how sore they've been or they're worried that they'll be made more sore. You start to track how often each individual person mentions those themes and how often each of the different people mention it. So when you start to see the same kind of things coming up between subjects as well as within subjects, then those start to become your main themes or the things that you're looking for uh, as you start to code and categorize the data. And that's typically what you'll do is you'll see, uh, you know, I, the, the best qualitative researchers I've known, you know, they use highlighters, they go over interview transcripts, they highlight anything related to being sore as yellow, anything related to being too busy as blue, and they really start to count and categorize each of these uh, different themes that they start to, to use. That's called generative coding, where you're looking in the data from different individuals or the same individual time over time, and you're attempting to find these themes, these commonalities, these re repetitions of similar concepts or words. And uh, then you start to think about and figure out what are the most important parts of the information that these people are giving you. Sometimes you use generative coding, which is where you develop these themes and these codes as you evaluate the data. Sometimes you go into it already with some ideas of uh, you know, what the themes may be. In the case of uh, the study that we've been looking at, if you work with a number of people, you probably know a lot of the common reasons people use to avoid or uh, not participate in different exercises. So we know probably some of the codes that we're gonna be looking for. However, you always have to be on the lookout for additional ideas to come to the surface that maybe you weren't aware of. When you're using pre-existing co codes, that's called a priori codes. When you're generating them as you go through the data, that's called generative coding. And often you may use a, com a combination of the two. There are even computer assisted programs that are going to allow you to input, for instance, the uh, transcripts of uh, a, an interview and spit out these different codes or themes based upon the words that are used or phrases that come up over and over. This is especially useful if you're dealing with um, interviews that have been conducted uh, with a large number of actors or by a variety of different uh, researchers. Uh, and then uh, you, know, you have a data source that's very large. When 
you are evaluating this data and you're looking at it, uh, again, there are different types of ways to interpret what you are reading or what you are hearing, or again, uh, the data that you have. I'm going to go over these each kind of in uh, briefly, but they range along this continuum that we've talked about before. When you interview an individual about their particular thoughts and beliefs and their experience, you know, you're getting the emic view uh, that they have, the insider view, the view that they had being part of that team, being part of that group and so on. You are as an outsider, the researcher typically is an outsider, <clears throat> excuse me, so that's providing a real useful uh, interpretation of the events because they give you that insider view. You may have thought their motivation was A, but then talking to them, you find out their motivation is B. Other ways to interpret the data kind of take that outsider view where you take your own expectations and apply that to the data. So we have different ways that we can interpret the data, some that are a little more leaning towards the insider viewpoint, some more focused on the outsider viewpoint. And let's take a look at those individually. The method of data interpretation is driven also by the methods, and the methods are driven by how you intend to interpret the data. So. In going over these, think about it, you know, obviously, if we're going to use phenomenology, then uh, the types of questions we ask may be different and uh, how we in approach the whole uh, interview experience might be somewhat different. But let's take a look at these different um, techniques, data interpretation techniques from the most insider to the most outsider. Phenomenology does uh, have the most insider approach because it you go into it, the researchers go into it truly trying to understand the event from the point of view of the actors. So they try to leave any preconceived notions that they have at the door and just listen to what the actors say, what their experiences are, what their thoughts are, and so on. The philosophy behind this uh, methodology is that reality is not objective, but subjectively experienced. So whatever, whatever the truth may be, it's what the people believe that's most important when you're using this type of data interpretation. Symbolic interaction is the second most uh, kind of insider viewpoint. Instead of kind of going with just whatever those individuals believe happened is what uh, is, is accurate, we do use some outside experiences uh, and we also, this, this method also means that Individuals that are undergoing the experience are affected by the social interactions with other individuals. So it isn't purely just an individual experience that uh, we, we look at. We also look at how other people responded and how that response may be affected others. So phenomenology is really the most individual of these interpretation techniques. Symbolic interaction relies a little bit more not just on what the individual thinks and what they experience, but also how others in the group may shape the experiences of the group as a whole. Grounded theory is really in the middle of this insider-outsider continuum. It seeks to generate and verify a theory, a theory that arises from the data, but we don't just look at it as truly an individual experience. We look at it uh, from an individual experience, but also includes uh, the understandings of the group and the preconceived notions of the researcher and potentially outside society. Critical theory takes a step even further to the right on our chart towards the outsider and certainly in, uh, utilizes the social impact that cultures have on individual behavior. So we don't just look at what the individual says affected them. We also look at the culture that the individual came from. We consider the group that they're in, the behaviors of the, uh, you know, the organizations that maybe they're representing or working with, and understand that whether they realize it or not, they may be utilizing some of those factors in how they experience a given uh, you know, uh, event and so on. And finally, the conceptual framework method of data interpretation is where we use a pre-existing framework and explanations of behavior 
that already exist. And then when we gather the data from the individuals that we're interested in, we use that data to refine the framework. So this is typically used in fields such as education, where we pretty have a we have a pretty good you know preconceived notion of maybe what educational methods will work better uh, or worse within a group, but we're looking to fine tune uh, those interpretations and our understanding of these different learning methods and so on. So each of these ideas of data interpretation. Uh, has advantages and disadvantages, but it just allows us to look at the data in slightly a slightly different fashion from, again, either more of an you know, internal uh, insider perspective or an outsider perspective. So if we do come across a qualitative research study when we are searching for articles on a particular topic, don't just turn away and say, oh, I'm not interested in what people feel or their, their beliefs or whatever it may be. Uh, consider it because often there can be some really useful information found in qualitative research. But just like any other research article, we do need to evaluate the quality of the research and how applicable it may be to our given question. So one thing that often is talked about in terms of evaluating qualitative research is the concept of trustworthiness. This is more of an issue with qualitative research than quantitative issue, uh, research, because remember, with qualitative research, the researcher themselves is sort of the instrument to collect the data. And therefore, they could be biased. They could uh, you know, turn people during the interview towards a certain direction and so on. So we really have to evaluate the trustworthiness of the article. So for instance, if I was to read an article and the person says, I interviewed a whole bunch of people and they all said A, um, that's not real trustworthy, right? They didn't give me examples. They didn't provide evidence of how they came to that conclusion. So we do need to evaluate qualitative research for trustworthiness to make sure that the uh, authors, the researcher, does not put their own biases or did not misinterpret the data as they, uh, again, extracted it from these large data sources. Now, to some extent, we can rely upon the journal that the article is published to evaluate this for us. Uh, but still, you want to uh, also think about it yourself and decide how much faith you want to put in their conclusions. So trustworthiness of an article is certainly impacted by a number of factors. First off, the authenticity and the credibility of the data collected. You know, could they talk to people that were actually there, actually involved, or did went through this event? Or did they talk to people who uh, uh, maybe knew people that were at the event? You know, there's a authenticity to being actually there. And we see this a lot in historical research, where we can't obviously interview uh, Thomas Jefferson, but we can interview people who have you know, uh, read a lot of his, his journals, his letters, his what have you, and therefore still have some credibility, but not as much as maybe the original source. We also want to know what the quality of the interpretation of the data is. So typically in a qualitative research, I'm expecting to see uh, quotes from the interview to verify what the person is claiming about the, uh, the data. I want to see how many people made that same statement or a statement like it. You know, I want to see the evidence that there is a good quality in the interpretation of the data. I also uh, want to see that they have fully described their research stance, that they are very, they, they use the term thick descriptions of the context and the actor's actions and thoughts. You know, I want to really be able to see what were the actors thinking. And I want to see that, again, based upon quotes and so on from the interviews themselves, from the actual actors themselves. I want to see quality sampling. Did they interview or uh, interact with the correct people, uh, a, 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 the people that are going to give us the best quality data? Like I said, maybe getting a sample of a variety of people that were involved in the incident or the event is the way to go. Uh, maybe there were people that were really in that inner circle and we want to make sure that they've sampled them. You want to look for triangulation of data. This is also a common term seen in qualitative research. If one person says something, but none of the others that are interviewed do, then there's nothing to support that claim. 
But if you do see triangulation, meaning there were several points where that same comment was made by a person or several people, then now that data is supported better and we see this triangulation. You want to see checks for accuracy. You know, did you transcribe, did the researcher transcribe the interviews correctly? Did someone else go over it to make sure it's accurate and so on? Make sure there's safeguards there. Was the data transformed into themes? You know, uh, were the themes that they developed appropriate based upon the, the, the data that was provided? Demonstrates appropriate level engagement with the actors. You know, if, if you only spent 20 minutes talking to the people, then you probably couldn't get a whole lot of information. Versus you'll see some studies where they spend a couple hours interviewing them, then they go over the transcripts of those interviews and then interview them some more to fill in the gaps and get additional information. You know, look at the level of engagement with the actors uh, so that they really could tease out these important themes and important information. And then obviously you want to see evidence that the researcher really has reflected upon this, has put a lot of thought into it, and uh, before making those conclusions. So you want to see that the evidence in the discussion, that the researcher provides evidence to support his or her conclusions. Again, a lot of this you can... Uh, uh, almost assume is there based upon the publication that you find it within, but still it's something that you want to think about as you're reading this type of an article. Another important aspect when you're evaluating qualitative research, it's the same thing as reading quantitative research. When I look at a title of an article or and then I read maybe the abstract, I look to see, hey, does this apply to me like and my clients? Like, is this something that's going to help me do my job better? Is it going to improve my professional practice? So what I'm evaluating there is the transferability. Can I take what these people interviewed in this study are saying and use it with the people I'm going to be working with? Can I transfer the findings to my population of interest? And if it is, if it does uh, meet that, uh, then I'm going to read the article and I'm probably going to get more information. And I'm going to be able to, I'm going to look for information that I can utilize enhancing my clinical practice. And an article to do that has to have, uh, again, adequate detail in the findings to provide that valuable information. And it also needs to have detailed descriptions of the actors uh, and the situation. So I can see, hey, were those people, these actors in this study, similar to my population? You know, can I... Are they similar enough that their ideas, their beliefs, their concerns potentially are going to be my client's concerns, as well as the situation? So again, we want to look to see that that information is going to be transferable to the groups I'm going to be working with. If it does, and then it seems of high quality, then I'll spend my time, my valuable time, in reading the article and then hopefully learn some interesting things that can help me advance my practical abilities and my professional practice. I uh, utilized uh, this textbook for a lot of the content from this uh, for this presentation. So check it out if you want more information. And then the article that I referred to is by Gray et al. And specifically, they examined uh, physical activity compensations among older adults. Uh, and again, a fascinating article, but also a great example of uh, a qualitative research uh, study, and it talks about a lot of the methodologies, uh, or it gives examples of a methodology uh, in its method. So it's a good read because it, again, kind of uh, does a good job of highlighting some of the concepts that we talked about in this presentation.